Hello, hello. We are back. This is the Let's Talk Near Death podcast where we talk about all sorts of interesting subjects about life, death and experiences in between. Now you probably think there's not so much in there but this is a really big set of topics and conversations that we cover. I'm really excited to get into our conversation today. Today I'm chatting with Robert Christopher Copus, who is based in the Netherlands. He is a scientist, he is an author, an NDE researcher, and also a member of the IANS board, so that's the International Association of Near-Death Studies. He has been researching near-death experiences for close to, I think it was 30 years, and has a whole lot of information around the themes, around what happens, around different elements of the near-death experience. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about this. He's got his book, his latest book is Impressions of the Near-Death Experience, which includes many quotes, many examples, and again, a bit more about the themes and the research that Bob, Robert, has been doing. So Bob Copas, welcome along to the Let's Talk Near-Death podcast. It's so nice to be on your show, and it's wonderful to be on the other side of the globe and still be able to talk to you as if we are sitting next door. I know, I love this. On your show. Thank you for joining me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So you've been studying near-death experiences close to 30 years. I know what it was like back then. I had my near-death experience roughly about 30 31 or 32 years ago. So I understand that back then there wasn't a lot of research that was pre-internet. There wasn't a lot going on that I could find at the time in regards to these experiences. What got you started? Why did you think I'm going to go and research this? Well, uh, it started all with reading the book from uh, Raymond Moody. Uh, You have to know that I was raised uh, Roman Catholic with Helen Purgatory, and as a child, I believe everything my parents told me, so also those (laughs) parts. And, uh, you know, when when they told me about that, uh, I thought, that's kind of scary, and I don't believe it. I I felt it was wrong somehow. And then I read the book by Raymond Moody, and in the book there is a woman talking about her near-death experience, and during her near-death experience, she had a a life review and in her life review she said I saw all the things that I was not very proud of and yet no one judged me and then I thought that's how it is why would anyone want to judge you you can do it yourself if you are in the in the light if you are in involved and enveloped into unconditional love and you see everything why would you need anyone else to tell you what you did wrong? Moreover, later I understood that the words wrong and right are uh, earthly words. And on yeah. the other side, they don't really apply. It's, it's maybe difficult for people to understand, but that's how I understand it from so many NDEers. years. They say, on the other side, there is no judgment. There is so little judgment that even the words good and bad are not there it's not necessary for some other reason i don't know wow so this book raymond moody's book i'm assuming it's the one life after life is that right yeah exactly yeah so this famous book that was long ago a long time ago yeah and then i i I did my uh, economic study and i went into a bank and i worked for a long time and then after well, something like 25 years ago, I thought, how is the research at this moment for that particular topic? And then I found that in the Netherlands, there had been done a lot of good research, and also in the United States and UK, and it's still ongoing. It's wonderful that it's still ongoing. So it was more of a personal interest. You'd read this book, and that it sparked something for you, and then you just carried on researching it. Is that how it played out? Yes, that's that's how it went. Well, actually, first I wanted to see what the, the uh, commonalities were for NDEs, and then I wanted to compare that with religions. So I, yeah. I studied uh, five major religions, and then I made the uh, the comparison between the essences of NDEs and the essences of religions, and uh, uh, that got out of hand. <laughs> it went. It was so big 
that I thought, why not publish it? Try to find a publisher. And um, when I was for my work in Australia, I got word that there was a publisher for me and I was really thrilled. So that was that's where it started with writing books. And so the last book uh, that was recently published in September is with actually only quotes, quotes of end of years, and then uh, ordered uh, by 12 chapters, uh, each of them covering a certain topic. So that was really thrilling. So the quotes, are these quotes where the experiencer has talked about something, for example, I'm going to say the light was bright white, brighter, but it didn't hurt my eyes is something that we hear quite often. Yeah. Are we talking quotes like that? Yeah, those things are very common. But, you know, the, the, the 12 chapters are, well, the first one is, of course, how you get out of your body. That sometimes you have very strange and funny stories. Uh, and getting into your body also sometimes give some funny stories too. Most of the time getting back into your body goes so quick that people don't really notice it. And there is no story to tell. But in some cases, there are funny stories or interesting stories to tell. And... I chose the stories that, that give some information of how it is over there. And then, of course, uh, after effect, that's the last uh, chapter. And then, of course, about there are chapters about the light, uh, life reviews, uh, that we are all important, why we are on Earth, uh, the, the very um, out-of-this-world kind of area that uh, is on the other side, Distressing and ease is there. So there are a, a lot of topics where I found a number of quotes to give people an impression of what an NDE is. You know, the, the point is, if you if you read only one or you hear maybe 10 NDEs, you don't get a real good impression. Mm. You need to have a lot of points of view, uh, different points of view, and then you maybe you get a little bit of an impression of what an NDE is. That's also the title of the book, Impressions of Near-Death Experiences. Mm. And I actually leave it up to the reader to come up to their uh, own conclusion. I don't have to bring them. And, and there's hundreds of quotes in those books, uh, by 100, uh, more than 100 NDEs. Oh, yes. Um, a question I get asked a lot when people learn that I do this research and they're very curious. The question I get so often is, what are the overlapping themes? What are the things that happens to the majority of experiences? Uh, what would you say some of those are? Well, for me, it, I leave it up to the reader to come up to their own conclusion what an NDE is after reading all those quotes. But if you would ask me, the, the major themes for me, are two. There's, one is, of course, unconditional love. Mm. Uh, and unconditional love is not a right word. It is um, because it's maybe used so often by Andy Ears, it loses its its uh, meaning. Uh, for instance, Anita Morjani, a, a woman who wrote a, a book about her own Andy E, very famous book, uh, mm. she said the word doesn't really cover what it actually is. It's more than unconditional love. So it is something that is uh, big and, and, and there. And the point is that people say it is everywhere. Actually, we are made up of unconditional love. We don't see it, but it's, mm. it's the, the fabric of everything there is. And the other thing that I came up and uh, came across and that I thought that really um, is mentioned also often is that we are all one uh, there yeah. is a oneness um, and it's you know if if you're sitting there in Auckland and I'm sitting in Amsterdam I have no feeling well we are talking very nicely but there's no oneness I don't feel how you how you do your life and so uh, I don't feel anything of the people in Ukraine or whatever but the point is that actually we are one. Uh, that's what so many people say. And there are wonderful quotes uh, about that. Even that we are, there are even quotes that people say, I was God um, for a brief moment. Uh, and you know, that, that brings you to a, a conclusion that whatever you do, 
to others, you actually do to yourself or to yeah. the universe, uh, to the one, to the, the oneness or to God. I don't know how you want to call these, uh, this uh, difficult to, to wrap a word around it, but God or the oneness, the supreme one, whatever, we all are part of it. So if I hurt you, I hurt myself, but I hurt the universe also. Yeah. There are wonderful quotes about that. So, Yeah, I'm reminded of the teaching around how we are one. We're different parts of the body and we all have yes. a different function, but we're all connected and the hand might not know what the big toe is doing or however that works, but we're all part of it. So if you stub the toe, you're going to feel the pain. We've all got our set things. Yeah. I'm curious. I give you a, a quote from a, a woman yes. in the Netherlands, and she she she's um, she passed away, so she's really gone now. But when she had her NDE, she said something like, well, "And this is a quote that shows you that uh, we are that she believed and felt that we are God, and that's something that uh, it's difficult for many people to." to understand or to to hear but i those are quotes that i came across and she's not the only one she said i feel completely perfect she was in her nde uh, and completely one with the light and the love and i know it was god i am in god and god is in me we are one perfect unity that's what she said and, and there are many of those quotes that people Feel that they are one, but also that they are God. God, yeah. I've also had a lot of people express this feeling to me about being God. About it's not a. They're not saying it to be powerful or arrogant or anything no. like that. It's this no. genuine feeling that everything is connected. Everything is possible. We are everything. Um, I interviewed a lady who talked about how she looked out of her window. She had an amazing story and she saw the tree and the tree was slightly going in the breeze and she felt that she was the tree. She was her and her physical body. She could distinguish between the two, but at the same time couldn't. And I've never forgotten that, how she talked about how she was the tree, but she was also the lady inside the house yeah. looking at the tree. Yeah, so I think it goes across so many levels, not just amongst humans. Um, what about animals? Do you think they could be in there? Yes, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. There are stories and the ears tell about animals. Um, let me give you just one. There, there is, um, it's not only that we can feel what other people felt, but we can also feel what other animals feel. Mm. Uh, and this is a story by Damien Brinkley, uh, an American yes. who um, um, had an NDE as a, as a result of a lightning strike while he was on a landline. Mm. Um, he uh, he saw himself, um, well, he had a, a life review and he saw himself driving with his uncle through the countryside somewhere in the US. And at one point, there was a farmer uh, hitting a goat that got stuck in the fence. And the farmer was angry with the goat and was whipping it. And then uh, Damien is a very inflammable person. <laughs> That's what he said of himself. He was very explosive. And um, he got out of the car, put the car down, uh, stopped the car, got out of the car, went over to this guy. And before the guy could understand what was happening, he was hitting him in such a way that the goat uh, could free himself and run away. Now, during his life review, he felt the, the, the uh, well, sort of the happiness on part of the goat that did happened and that yeah. he could run away, that he could escape this awful situation he found himself in. So Damien felt what the goat felt. And that needs well people need to understand that that is the case so we are um we are closely connected not only with other people but with yeah. the nature in general just like you said with the tree 
also the tree and also animals. And yeah. I know this other wonderful story of, of an Iranian guy. It's also in my book. All these stories are in my book. This is a guy who was a very small boy. And as a small boy, he was told by his mother to fetch some water from the river. And he went down with a bucket and he filled it up all the way. And then he wanted to go back home. But then he noticed the bucket was too heavy for him. So he passed by a, a, a tree uh, uh, standing in the, in, in the blazing sun and there was nothing mm. around. Him. And then he thought, hmm, the tree is kind of thirsty. <laughs> I can imagine how a child would think of that. And then he said, he, he thought, let me empty a little bit of the bucket in, near the tree so it can drink and I'll bring the rest home. And then in his life review, he felt how it was. Uh, for for the oh, tree wow. and that and the universe well he said the angels and everything were so pleased with that gesture that i made Lord. for this little tree. so it's the the small things that count as well it's not only the big things we do it's also those kind of small gestures of love that are so important oh they are i'm also reminded how much animals and plants ground us and that if we, you know, if we spend time with animals, it's very therapeutic for most people. You know, some people have fears or it's not for them. But in general, animals are very therapeutic. They're very loving, caring. They give a lot. Cats take quite a lot, but they still give. Um, love my cat. <laughs> um, but yeah, getting in the garden, grounding, feeding, nurturing. It's just, it's such a two-way thing. You give the love, but you receive it back. Yes, therapeutic. therapeutic. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm reminded just how the ecosystem's made up and how just amazing it is that the very things that we need for some things are literally right in front of us. We have trees, plants, grass, everything we need everywhere. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're connected on some level. We have to be. I believe we are. We are. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, um, Bob, I want to come back to something you said because it triggered some curiosity in me. You were talking about your books made up of different parts. There was one part dedicated to how people leave and re-enter their body. You said there's some funny stories, and I bet there are. Um, are there any themes around leaving the body? I personally can't remember leaving my body in my experience. I know I did because I was outside of it, but... Um, any themes around what that might feel like, what that experience is like, maybe any of the funny stories? Yeah, there's uh, there's a few of them. Uh, uh, many of them are in my book, but uh, let me give you an example of uh, a woman who was in the hospital somewhere and she had uh, uh, problems with her uh, lungs and then at one moment she was uh, out of her body and what you hear often, she was just against the ceiling looking down. And she looked down on, on a woman lying in bed and she thought, oh, she has the same nightgown as I have. <laughs> obviously, that was her. But just a, a second later, she realized that it was her and then she realized that she was, well, that it was strange. You know, people don't really, well, some people really understand this is, I am dead now. This mm. is dead. Some people don't really understand it. Uh, and in her case, it dawned on her that something strange was going on. And moreover, at that moment, she heard her husband, who was in the corridor on a on telephone, uh, in a telephone booth. You know, previously mm. we had those things yeah. that we go into. <laughs> Free cell phones, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> cell phones, yeah. Well, and, and she heard him talk to a friend in another state in the United States. And then uh, when she was replying, uh, the friend in the other state, she would be in the office of this other person in that other state. And when her oh. husband said something, she would be back again uh, in the telephone booth in the, ho uh, in the hospital. I mean, that went back and forth. And, you know, it, it means that place is not a, a, a limitation for us no. if we are there. You can be wherever you want to be. Um, and that that's also like uh, Anita Morjani said something like that too. 
And I'd, I'd like to uh, mention this story about uh, an Iranian, another Iranian guy. And uh, he said he was taken into a hospital uh, and then um, after a car accident somewhere. And then he thought of his mother and he, and then when he was thinking about his mother, because he was thinking, well, I'm out of my body and I don't know where I am and how that is possible and where would my mother be? And then he was with his mother in the kitchen uh, where she mm. was preparing dinner in some other place. Uh, so there was an, a totally different place in Iran. And then he thought of a friend uh, and then he was in the house with that friend. Mm. And he thought of another friend and that went on. So he, he was able to be in the house of these friends, in the house, in the kitchen with his mother and in mm. the ho hospital at the same time. He could see everything at the same time. It's just what you want to see, where you want to be, that you can get that. It's, it, it is an amazing world because um, you seem to have some kind of influence over it. And like, like for instance, um, uh, Ellen Dye, a friend of mine in the United States, she said, uh, I was hanging in this wonderful uh, black void. It was dark. Mm -hmm. um, it was wonderful. It was a lot of love there, and I felt soothed, and it was terrific. And then after a while, she thought, well, it's nice here, but I'd like to see something else than only this darkness. And then she said, it was as if a big hand with a number of brushes came rushing along and uh, painted the most wonderful scenes for her, like rolling hills and, and uh, waters and trees and butterflies everywhere uh, and flowers and stuff like that. Yeah. And that's what she wanted to see. She got that because she asked for it. So things like that is what you sometimes hear. So it, yeah. it's, it's you have some kind of influence over what you want to see. It's amazing, isn't it? And I think we do. And I'm reminded of so many stories and examples I've heard where right before someone dies or at the moment of someone dies or close to the event, uh, people feel that person. So I'm thinking of the mother in the kitchen preparing dinner will suddenly think of the person, the son who's died. Um, it happens quite often where people think, oh, that's weird. I was literally thinking of them at the moment when they hear about the death later on. I was yeah. literally thinking about them at 2 p.m. and that would have been the time that they passed. So, yeah, I do believe that we have some element of it. How much control we have, who knows, who knows. But, um, yeah, I find it interesting that people have these stories of feeling like they were their presence was close by or they came to say goodbye right before they left or yes. right after. At the time, you know, there, there can't be too many coincidences. So, yeah. yeah, fascinating. It all adds up for me. The process of being out of the body, a lot of people haven't shared with me, and I have interviewed hundreds of experiences, a lot of people haven't shared what the actual process feels like. It seems to be I was just out of my body. I was looking down on it, or I was in this, you talked about the void, this dark hmm nothingness space have you heard many stories about that process what it felt like well some some people say that they uh, felt that they were leaving from their head i heard that several times as one woman she said uh, who was on an operation uh, with a catheterization uh, and she said i felt that on my toes going up to my uh, body into my head, I felt the the power leaving me, um, something like that. But pe most of the time, people, um, if they have a story, uh, because sometimes it goes so quick that they are out yeah. of their body into this wonderful other mm. area. If they uh, if they have some time on Earth still, uh, you know, then they can look around and and. Most of the time, people don't realize that they have died or that they are in the process yeah. of dying. 
So they like, for instance, uh, another story of a, a woman who uh, went uh, to um, a, a Jewish uh, synagogue with her two children. It was at the moment she got out of the car, there was a, a big uh, storm coming. Uh, she took her umbrella. She went walking towards the door of the uh, the synagogue. The, the, one of the children, she held the hand of the child. And then there was a sizzling, a, a big crack, big noise, and a sizzling. And then she thought, okay, this is not good, but let's get to the synagogue quickly. And then the child rushed away screaming. And she proceeded uh, with the umbrella. She went into the synagogue, and then she found a, a big uh, a number of people there uh, looking outside what had happened. And then she turned around, and she saw herself lying on the ground. And the umbrella was uh, blackened uh, next to her. Oh, and her feet were sticking out of her, her, her uh, shoes. I mean, oh, it shows you that you apparently you can just you you can walk or feel that you're walking still yeah. while you are already out of your body you just pop out of it one person said even and that i like that quote so much it was so easy i just popped out of uh, myself like a, a toast pops out of a toaster oh yeah i like that it was so quick oh gosh that's amazing i'm really captured by the umbrella that yeah. not only was she no longer in her body, she was she just carried on holding a physical yes. object as she walked along she without realizing she's that. dead. It, that oh no words. It's so incredible. The word pop, you talked about popping out of the body. I hear this word so often. I don't know if it's just because it's English language and that seems like the word that we've given this experience, but to pop out. But coming back into the body, now I've heard all sorts of experiences, things like it was like trying to get into a really wet wetsuit, um, things like trying to compress the most enormous thing into the smallest thing, um, jigsaw puzzle, trying to put the pieces back in, but they're the right pieces don't quite fit. I've heard so, so many stories. So it seems like the process of coming back into the body is a lot more, I don't know if I'd say memorable, but it's it sticks out more than the how easy it is just to pop out. And a lot of people don't even know that they've popped out. A lot of people don't know that they've died until quite a bit onwards. Um, yeah. yeah, any thoughts or any themes around coming back into the body? Well, as you said, it is like it is like uh, you put something most of the times people it goes so quick people don't realize that they go back mm. but if they if there is a story you have these stories like what you just said i'm too big to go into that body um, mm. one woman said it was like putting an elephant into a coca-cola can yes i've heard that one too impossible, <laughs> impossible. or how I, I was wondering how they would put this big expanse of myself into my body and then they did that by hugging her so tight that they could squeeze her in oh, uh, wow. things like that and th there's also a man mentioning of it's a wetsuit you know it's and it's too yeah. small it's yeah um, and it's, it's weird so and it's it's dead meat it's horrible to go into this cold something oh, those uh, quotes there are many of those but there's a nice story of uh, Kimberly Clark Sharp. She's also in my book. Mm. Uh, she said, uh, she starts by telling always that parking uh, parallel for her is a, is a big thing. She can't do that properly because she's always two feet away from the, uh, from the curb. <laughs> and then, Can relate completely. <laughs> and then, but she said, going back into my body was the same thing. I was off by two feet. She was not all the way in. She was looking from the side of her, uh, at her side of her head. She said, I couldn't really get in there. Um, yeah. But I was close. But it was like, it was still too far away. I was, I didn't, didn't park well into this body. And then the, the funny thing was there was a, um, I think it was a firefighter who came uh, pushed all the people around her away because she was uh, having a, something in the middle of the street. 
people were gathering around. No one knew what to do. So <laughs> he had to shove all the people around away, yeah. go to her, and then try to give her resuscitation and then press his lips on her lips. And then he did that. And that moment was important for her because she got a connection with something living, apparently. And then that made it possible for her to, well, to pop back into her body. And she felt mm. exactly what the guy felt and the, the weariness of having to put his lips on a total stranger's lips mm. in order to breathe her. Uh, and those kind of things. I mean, you are apparently able to feel uh, what it is to be this other person. And that's, you know, that's another reason why I think we are all one. There's yeah. also in life reviews, if you look at life reviews, people say, I could see what I did to others, but not as an onlooker. I was also the other person. Mm. I felt what it is, what I did to this person, being nice or being not so nice. I mean, uh, but it's you. There is no difference then between you and someone else, mm. and that's why I think there is a oneness. That's so important. And by the way, we're talking about the moment that people are close to their body or uh, popping out of it and being able to roam around a little bit. Uh, but those are the important moments for us, also researchers, to get into because sometimes they see things that can later be uh, corroborated or confirmed. Yeah. Uh, you know? yeah. And those are, there are hundreds of stories. There's a very nice book also published by IONS and it's called oh, yes. Sam Does Not Die. There's hundreds of these stories in it. Um, and this gives circumstantial evidence that our body or that our consciousness can be separate from our body and still be there. Uh, mm. It is still not really a proof that there is an, an afterlife, but the people that have had such an experience where it could be uh, confirmed that they were outside of the body uh, also had these stories about this wonderful other dimension or how you want to put it mm. so i i think if we if we accept this circumstantial evidence that uh, your, your consciousness can be separate from your body then take the next step as well it's it's not scientific but i would go that step and believe that there is this other world where we all will be going to our home mm. Mm. Yeah, I find it fascinating with um, people, you, this evidence that you're talking about, so they'll see an item in the room. I remember someone talking about a shoe up on the ceiling of the hospital. Yes, and on the ledge. Yeah, that's the yeah. one, and sure enough, there was a shoe there, and nobody had known about it for who knows how long it had yeah. been there. Yeah, I mean, that's, how do you dispute that? <laughs> that's the same person, uh, Kimberly Clark Sharp, that I spoke about. Oh, that was Kimberly? Yep. Yeah, well, she, she was... That was not Kimberly herself, but she was the uh, the social worker in the hospital who spoke to uh, an NDE -er, and the NDE -er said, "Well, something strange happened to me. I was flying out of the window, and uh, I could see the hospital from above, and you know the whole story. And then and then she had her NDE, and she had to come back again. But she said, when I was flying out of the window, a floating rather." Uh, I could see a shoe lying in the, mm. uh, in the ledge of the hospital and um, it had these and these characteristics. Uh, yeah. uh, there was a wear spot over the, one of the toes and uh, the, the brand was there. And, whatever. and then Kimberly thought, hmm, I, I'm going to see if I can find that shoe. And she went into the attics and she opened all the windows i can imagine how she does that then and then <laughs> looking out of the windows seeing looking at all the ledges and uh, finally yeah. she found the shoe that yeah documented incredible i mean that is the evidence that we're talking about people see things within the operating room if they have a an experience on the operating table there will be something in there um there'll be conversations that take place they say hearing's the last sense to go. So I imagine a lot can actually happen before the 
body or the brain catches up to the circumstance of hey I'm dying it's it's so fascinating we've talked a lot about leaving coming back in I'd love to know any more themes around why these happen if you've got any conclusions why they happen and also I'd love to touch on the choice to come back because I'm I'm actually aware right now as we're talking I'm just feeling the awareness of how many people had these amazing experiences but didn't come back to tell us they actually stayed dead and I've always been curious what do they experience that's different I mean it must go much deeper and then it's it's yeah. infinite it's they don't come back but yeah any thoughts around why these happen and why some get a choice and some don't why these happen why do the NDEs happen uh I don't know. I, I think they have happened throughout history uh, because there are some instances where you could say, well, maybe that was an NDE. Um, mm. But they they occur much more often nowadays. And why is that? Because our medical system, at least in uh, the, the wealthy countries, has uh, gone up in mm. such a way that we can pull people back again. Mm. And previously they would just die but now we have all these resuscitation kind of stuff and we mm. have we are so clever in doing all that and uh, sometimes people get really angry when they have to go back again <laughs> yeah when they were pulled back into their body they don't really always like that uh so i i you know I think there will be more and more of these vertical observations that I spoke about. You know, those are the verifiable out-of-body experiences, the, the, the examples with the shoe. Mm. Um, and I think that um, after a while, I hope that the general public will value these uh, experiences because uh, we need to change. I think we humans we need to change our way of life if we really uh, if people really start believing that um uh, these experiences are real and that comes then from those verifiable out of body experiences then they might be looking into what the what the messages are and the messages are that love is so important that it's all there for us and but it, we also have to to try to do it for others and the other thing is that we are all one. So it's a zero sum game. If I do something to you, I actually do it to myself. It, mm. I can't gain anything from doing something to you and thinking I, I will not be affected. Uh, mm. So it's a zero sum game. If it's a zero sum game, we will change our way of life. We will be more loving to each other and towards nature. So that's that's what I hope and I, I really well, I, I believe in that it will come because this goes on and on. There will be more and more of these experiences because we are so clever in getting people back before they die. Mm. And the other question you, you said is why do peop some people have a choice to come back and why others don't? Uh, that's You know, that's the case and I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is like you say, some people don't really get a choice um, or they get a choice and they are shown uh, what um, is important to do and then they go back. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, someone in the United States, she was uh, having her NDE and she was absolutely happy over there. She loved it and she didn't want to go back. Yet they told her, you have to go back. And then she said, no, I'm, I'm not going back. Uh, and and she, she screamed like a child to stay there. And then uh, she said, the next moment um, that I remember, I was in my body again, in the hospital. And uh, the nurse asked me, uh, she said to me, uh, you're back again. And I asked, why am I back again? Uh, what happened? Mm -hmm. And what she what she wanted to know is what happened between the moment that I said no I don't want to go back and yeah. I'm back again. What yeah. was it that made it happen? 
And the nurse thought, uh, oh yeah, you, you were in an accident. So, so she tried to explain what it was that made her come to the hospital. And she said, no, I don't want to hear about that. That's not interesting. I want to know what happened between the moment that I said, no, I don't go back and I'm back again. <laughs> so, yeah. so it happens that, that something occurs in that period of time. So, um, and what, what I hear from others is that uh, sometimes people are shown their purpose on earth. Uh, yeah. And uh, apparently we have agreed to do something on earth. We all have a task. We all have a, a purpose on earth. Everyone. Everyone. So uh, if, if we wouldn't be here if we wouldn't have a purpose. And if mm -hmm. it's not done yet, you have to finish it. Otherwise, you have to go back again. In, mm. in an other body and to do what you are supposed to do. So sometimes you hear explicitly uh, this reasoning, uh, and but never it is that people hear what their task is. That's interesting. I know. It would make it so much easier, wouldn't it? Yeah. If we all knew, yeah, we could just do reason. it. I think that's the reason. I think that's the reason. If you know what your task was, you would rush out of the door and just go about doing that task and hope to die soon. But that's not what it's supposed <laughs> to be, I think. You have yeah. to live your life and, and go through struggles. And I mean, you know, the other thing that I understand from people who had an NDE is that it is just thrilling to go to Earth, to be in a body, to live a life. It's exciting. And it's, it's what we all wanted to do. We are here on our uh, with free will. Mm, so, mm. Uh, and to to tell a story there, um, uh, Betty Guaidano, she is uh, uh, someone who has a podcast in the United States on behalf of uh, Ions. Yeah, she said she had a <clears throat> very difficult life. She was the child of uh, parents that uh, were abusing drugs uh, and were in a very bad state there. They, the, the uh, family was dysfunctional in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of violence um, and she became drug addict as well. And she tried to cheat people out of their money. She was, uh, she did prostitution to get money. And, you know, all these things that are, uh, you, it's unbelievable. If you see these people, you think, oh, what a difficult life you have. <clears throat> now, she was in her NDE after she had a, an overdose. And mm -hmm. during her NDE, she saw that she was, before she came to, to life, before she came to Earth, she was looking at what kind of life she could have. And she, she was given choices. And she said she likened it to uh, being in a grocery store in a supermarket yeah. where you could go around with your cart and pull out of the shelves all kinds of experiences. And there she went. She she said, I, I saw myself going through that supermarket to get all these experiences. Prostitution, wow, let's do that. And incest, yes. And then drug abuse, wonderful. Put that in my cart as well. And that's yeah. the way she went through the... the, the, the uh, the supermarket, it's unbelievable. But you hear more of these stories where people can choose what kind of experiences they want to have. I think, well, you know, I, I, I have my uh, point of view is more that we, we are all one. Uh, it, it means that if a child is born, um, something has to go in there. It's a vacancy there. So, and who goes in there, that's, well, God or the divine or whatever. So, mm -hmm. uh, and there are, at this moment, there are children in, in dysfunctional families um, or babies being born in those kind of families or in families where there is uh, strife or war. I mean, if you look at Europe, we have two wars going on our borders, mm -hmm. like in Ukraine and in Gaza. I mean, there are children there as well. Do they have a choice? No. Mm -hmm. it's, it, there's a vacancy there, and who goes in there? It's. I think it's. It's the one goes in there, and and that's and that one is living a life that is living also your life and is living also my life. 
and the listeners love. Well, you, you know, <laughs> this is my reasoning about going further into the oneness. Right? If we are all one, yeah, then that, this is kind of a consequence, I would say. Mm. It's my 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 uh, opinion, <laughs> but it's it's uh, thought of because of the oneness that has been mentioned so often. It has been mentioned so so often. A lot of people come back to the point of it all is love. We are connected. Everything comes down to love, which I, I love. I I appreciate that concept. Um, I've really enjoyed chatting with you, Bob. I love that you're a scientist, and so it's got quite a lot of research based conversation today. You've covered a lot of things. Like we have actually skimmed the surface. I know that this topic just goes so so big and so so deep. But we've talked about why we might be here, about choosing to come here. We've talked about the themes, the experiences. There are quite a few there that overlap with uh, examples and stories that I've heard. And I really just appreciate your grounded research. And I'm still thinking back to 30 years ago, there was hardly anything about out about that. And I am so grateful for Raymond Moody, Dr. Raymond Moody, with his book, Life After Life. Because I have spoken to so many people who say, oh, it all started when I read his book and it sparked something in yeah. me and then it carried on to this and this and this. And then today, it's a major piece of this puzzle of bringing awareness and understanding and exploring all these beautiful topics. I, you know, I love this one story about a little girl, uh, Christina. She was eight years old who was abducted by uh, two men who tried to drown her. Um she was Why? underwater, facing up, uh, looking through the water, seeing the sun. And at the same time, she was hovering above the scene, looking down on what was happening. And she saw her father rushing over to her help, to help her, to rescue her. But at the same time, she also had her NDE. And in her NDE, there was uh, this elderly man that spoke with her and that said, you have to go back. Uh, but and then she said it couldn't have been anyone else than God. So um, and then God said to her, "Listen, you have to go back. Life is easy. It has only four ingredients, and the four ingredients I just want to tell you. The first one is love. Second one is be loved. The third one is just be, and the fourth one is experience life." So love, be loved, just be, and experience love. And I find that so interesting. It's just one of these stories that just um, are so important for me because it shows you that love is so important. And just being on earth and experiencing life. Your listeners, if there are listeners with uh, problems, be sure that you are loved unconditionally that you have a task here that there's a purpose for you on earth and that there's there's a reason for why you are going through these troubles and be sure that you are loved beyond your wildest dreams i think that's important to say mm, i really like that i feel like coming a child's perspective it just sounds so simple doesn't it it sounds like four rules, or not even rules, four concepts. Just do these and everything will be all right. And then we complicate it and we make it really hard. And because life is quite messy. Um, it's interesting when you, you've said a couple of times about how life is simple. We chose to be here. We're so happy to be here. And it's quite straightforward. And I look around and I go, oh, I don't know. But to hear it through those child words of the four concepts, love be loved um enjoy life like this is a big one for me getting out there and having experiences and i talk about squeezing the juice out of life let's really do this life sensibly yes. but filled with love compassion and making things as good as we can and i just think it goes such a long way i love it <laughs> yeah yeah so bob copas thank you so much um links for the book are down below all of the information to get hold of Bob is down below. And I'm so grateful for your research. I'm so grateful that you've taken something that had that little spark 
made it bigger. It's a big piece today and yeah, thank you for what you do.